Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn about delicious stories and food adventures for the mind, body, and soul. My first guest is Katie Quinn. She's an interesting gal. She's a video creator, podcast host, and cookbook author. Katie thinks there is a story to be told everywhere and that food connects people. Through that, every week, Katie posts food and travel videos to her YouTube channel, Q Katie, which has over 5 million views and nearly 40,000 subscribers. Her slogan and podcast title is Keep It Quirky because Katie thinks life, both in the kitchen and out of it, is more enjoyable if you don't take yourself too seriously. But today, we're really serious about cheese, wine, and bread, discovering the magic of fermentation in England, Italy, and France. And Katie Quinn is coming to us from Southern Italy. Hi, Katie. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Oh, I am so happy to have you and so super excited to talk with you about your journey because you are blending the things that I find most passionate and juicy in life, which is food and travel. Yes, yes, totally. I mean, they're really you can't separate them, right? They, no. the overlap is so huge. <laughs> and happiness producing, you know, like people yes. are always happy when they're traveling for the most part, even though, you know, quirky things happen and there might not always <laughs> be 100% happy moments. But I think because it, it, it puts us in a state of curiosity where we're more, more open-minded yes. and receptive. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love that you just described it in that way. Absolutely. You know, I think curiosity as the driver for life is, is just like such a game changer, right? That's how you can keep it quirky is by, by looking at life through curious eyes. And you've been keeping it quirky in an interesting way. Like you've traveled <laughs> to these three countries and apprenticed in s very interesting and big food fields. Yeah. So, I mean, quirky is definitely a word for, I mean, I kind of, you know, I embrace the word quirky because a part of that I see is just like being who you are, right? Like being yourself unabashedly. And, um, the way that I chose to do that when I, when I had the idea for this book, I was like, well, I want to learn more about these things that I love or, you know, kind of air quotes love, but I don't know much about them. Like I say, I love cheese, but I don't know how milk becomes cheese, right? Like I don't, I say, I say <laughs> how it gets from the cow to the round to the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, my curiosity led me to full on immersion. I was like, I, I am just going to throw myself in here. And, you know, the form that that ended up taking was working as a cheesemonger in shops in, in actually Neil's Yard Dairy, which anyone who is an Anglophile would know is kind of the preeminent cheese shop in London. Um, you know, I, I worked at a goat farm in rural Somerset making goat's milk cheese. I worked vineyards in Italy. I worked at boulangeries all around France. So, you know, quirky is one word for it. Another word potentially, and I thought this at, at times in my journey, is just foolish. I was like, what am I, what am I even doing? What am I getting myself into? I, I really had that feeling at times, but, you know, I, I came out the other end so inspired, smarter, and, and understanding these foods and, and the systems of our 
world and having met these incredible people. And I came out the other end, uh, just really a, a better and happier person, I dare say. I can, I can bet on that. I mean, I would bet on that because you are following, you know, what Joseph Campbell appropriately calls it your bliss. Right. Mm. Like, you know, when we follow our bliss, he, and I don't know if you know the work of Joseph Campbell, but he wrote doors will open for us where there had once been walls. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I think that that's true. I totally think I think there's something to that. Um, yeah. And I I did feel drawn on on really just like a, a cellular level <laughs> to explore these things, these foods that. So so basically. I had just moved to London with my partner for his job um, after 10 years in New York City where my career was going really great and then, you know, got engaged to, to this dude. <laughs> <laughs> his name's Connor and he's amazing and he's my husband. Um, but, I, you know, I followed him across the sea and I really felt like lost. I think when we landed there, I, I was just like, wait, what am I doing? What's going on with my life. And I think there was also the nerves of like, oh, I'm about to marry this person. Is this the right decision? And like all, you know, all of the life things. <laughs> um, and really that is when it was something about cheese, wine, and bread, these ancient and essential things of, of humanity. And I, that's all I needed on my dinner table every night. And And I think that's where I was just really drawn to discover more the history of it, but not just the history of it, like the why of it, how it happens and what happens when people are possessed by these foods. And that's exactly what the artisans who I worked with and interviewed and, and just had the complete pleasure of getting to know that they are just possessed by their craft, by their art of making these things. And man, it was just endlessly inspiring for me. I want to just tap into one of your experiences, which is um, connecting with um, cheesemakers in, in Britain who are women, you know, and, and, yeah. and what you discovered about that process, because, you know, many of us think, you know, of, of the original artisan cooks, bakers, winemakers, et cetera, et cetera, as being male dominated. And what you uncovered was something different. Yeah. You know, this was, yeah, I, I love, I, the, the, the females in the cheese scene are like my true, I call one of them, a my, um, dairy godmother, sort of fairy godmother. <laughs> Your Be, dairy godmother. I love that. Just, just incredible, incredible women. But so, um, sorry, I'm getting on a bit of a tangent already. So basically historically in England, uh, we, you know, and there's a long, long, very rich history of cheesemaking in England. Um, you know, the cheesemaking in the States is influenced directly by the cheesemaking in England, right? Because those are the people who went <laughs> to the States when it was, when it was first just becoming a country. Um, you know, we think Wisconsin, but like, no, we, we should actually think of Somerset, England when we think of cheddar. Yeah. Um, Interesting. nothing, nothing against Wisconsin cheddar, but the, the reason for that is that way, way back in the day, you know, it's an agrarian society and people are, they live in a farmhouse and they have their farms and they're working the land. And the men would go out and work the fields and the women would, you know, stay home and do all of the family stuff. Um, of course, juggling a bajillion balls. And one of their duties was going in the, the like shed next door and turning the milk into cheese and or butter in some cases, right? But milkmaids, if you think of the term milkmaid, like that was, that was women, that was all housewives and their daughters. And, you know, it was, it was a, a female run craft for, for a very, very long time, basically until industrialization came about and kind of, and then the dudes took over. <laughs> Grr. I want to ask yeah, you right? about this, though, because you have a, a recipe that was shared with you that our listeners might think is quirky and yet simply divine. Yeah, I think I know what you're going to say. Are you talking about the cheddar brownies? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Best thing ever. So I, so when I was working as a cheesemonger, I was surrounded by fellow cheese heads, people who were just so into cheese, so, so into cheese and not just any cheese too, but like really quality artisan cheese. This is the kind of cheese where wheel by wheel, it tastes slightly different because the seasons change because, you know, what the animals are eating changes, whether it's a cow or sheep or goat. And also, by the way, speaking of just milk, you know what animal it comes from and it has a distinct taste and it's all, you know, it's so much more nuanced than what a lot of people think think of, I guess, I guess when you think of just grabbing something off the grocery store shelf, which was also me for the record, like (laughs) prior to, prior to this adventure, (laughs) prior to this adventure. Absolutely. Yeah. I I think I didn't understand the nuance that was there. And I, I saw cheese largely, not always, but, but in some ways as a commodity food and I, and, and working in the cheese industry in England, just blew my mind really that like, this is, yeah, sure. There's a place for that kind of cheese, just like there's a place for three buck Chuck wine, but there's also a place for like a wine that is incredible and that you're willing to pay a premium price for because it's incredible and it's worthy of celebration. And, you know, and the same, that same thing exists with cheese, which I think prior, you know, rewind five years ago, because at this point now I had been working on this I've been working on this book for like four years. So now it's finally out and I, and I'm giving birth to this thing. But, you know, when I started this journey, I was really um, almost like a just different person in terms of what well, a babe I knew. in the woods, um, right? Like a neophyte. A babe in the- <laughs> totally, totally, Lisa. But like, I think that that's the thing that I hope is really appealing about the book and the way I write it is that I take the reader along on the journey with me, right? Yeah. So someone who is also a newbie or just loves cheese, but don't know, doesn't know why, you know, they can understand right along with me, all of these things. At the same time, someone who loves cheese and is really knowledgeable of cheese. Also, there's going to be a ton to learn partially because of all of the artisans that I worked with, right. And interviewed and had the chance of, of learning from, okay, I'm getting way off of the cheddar brownies topic. I was going to, I was going to circle back to those cheddar brownies before we take the break, because I'm salivating over here. I want to know about them. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, one of my coworkers at Neil's yard dairy was like, yeah, like she, she mentioned this idea of putting chunks of cheddar in a brownie. And I was like, what? That's, that sounds like weird and kind of ridiculous, but also, yeah, I'm very intrigued by it. So just with that little nugget of an idea in my head, I went home that night and made my, my favorite brownie recipe. And then I took my favorite cheddar, uh, which is Montgomery's cheddar, it's a British farmhouse cheddar and just cracked it into chunks. It's really mature. So it kind of gets, you know, crystallized and it, Mm. and and it kind of caramelizes Mm -hmm. in the oven and and all the sweet notes come out. So So I just salty and sweet. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. (sighs) Salty and sweet. Like the, the ideal version of that. Right. And, and the nuttiness of the cheese comes out and just complements the, the rich fudginess so excellently. So, so anyway, I like tried it. I just, with like my own kind of like recipe and was like, well, let's see, this seems ridiculous, but let's see. And it was absolutely to die for. And, you know, fresh out of the oven with, when the brownies are still a little warm, the, the cheddar almost could be like white chocolate chunks. It like takes on this like sweet, but rich and nutty, savory pop. And it's just the best darn thing I've ever had. I don't know if anybody out there is with me on this, but my eyes are closed and I'm in this thought experiment with Katie about the taste of this and I'm hungry, but let's take a break. Amazing. (laughs) (laughs) To learn more about Katie Quinn and her work, please go to www.katie-quinn.com on Twitter at QKatie and on Facebook, the QKatie and on Instagram, that handle is QKatie. The book we're talking about is Cheese, Wine and Bread, Discovering the Magic of Fermentation in England 
Italy, and France. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Before we take that little break, let's talk about the importance of playtime, even for adults. Research says that play helps relieve stress, boost creativity, and stimulates the mind. Plus, it improves relationships and our connections to others. Do you remember the games we all played as kids? In my house, we were big on jigsaw puzzles, board games, and cards. Playing games passed the time and was always a cure for boredom. One thing was and is certain, taking the time to play makes us happy. And today, Best Fiends is my favorite casual mobile puzzle game with more than 100 million downloads. What I love most is that Best Fiends challenges me to use my brain in new ways to strategize and conquer new levels. This gives me a shot of adrenaline and makes me feel like a winner. I'm working my way towards level 4,300 and counting. I've been playing Best Fiends for the past year and I'm happily hooked. And if you're anything like me, you will be too. The fun never ends at Best Fiends because there is always something new to explore. There's no game over with thousands of puzzle levels. You'll never run out of goals to achieve. Don't blame me if you end up kind of obsessed and find yourself playing in strange ways places. And if you're in need of more play in your life, come join me for a squeaky clean good time. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now let's take that quick pause. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit harvestinghappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back continuing the conversation with Katie Quinn as we explore delicious stories and food adventures for the mind, body, and soul. So for you hungry souls out there who are listening, we're moving on. We're moving on to Italy. We're moving on to the wine country and an extended part of Katie's adventure. Over to you, Katie. Yeah. So, well, so I, as you said, I focused on wine in Italy. That's the way that my experiences for the book took me uh, working at vineyards here. But I do have to say that food, of course, of course. plays a role <laughs> because come on, we're talking about Italy, <laughs> first of all. But then second, you know, a table with just wine on it sure is a great table, but how much better is it when it has food on it and especially Italian food with Italian wine. So, um, I, you know, I, I tried to delve into this whole sphere, um, in this country as much as I could. And a part of that exploration, when I was researching for the book, I spent an entire month in Italy, just traveling around Italy, meeting as many winemakers as I could, eating as much as I could, learning as many regional pasta shapes as I could. Uh, and it was when I was visiting Puglia, actually the region where I'm living now, that's a little uh, spoiler giveaway. alert. <laughs> yeah, it was a spoiler <laughs> alert. Sorry. <laughs> But it does all circle back around, right? So you know where it starts, you know where it ends. And the journey is something that I just could have never dreamt up in, in my wildest dreams. I was researching in Puglia and realized, I looked at the map and I realized, hey, I'm only like, an, you know, an hour and a half or something drive from this little town in the region of Basilicata, this little town called Tursi, that is supposedly where my great grandfather is from. He was born there and then immigrated to the States around 1900. Like I had all of these like loose dates and like loose ideas. I wasn't even sure he was from this town, but I was visiting a winemaker really nearby. And I was like, you know, I might as well just swing by this town. Like there, there's no reason not to Katie, just do it, just do it. And, uh, and I, against all odds, and I say this because I had his birth date wrong by a couple of years. And so it w took a lot of going back and asking this same grumpy Italian guy in, the, in this like bureaucratic office, um, to look again, but I found his birth certificate. Wow. And it changed the course of my life. I 
don't think that's an exaggeration um, because of, yeah. So my husband and I live in Italy now. I am now an Italian dual citizen. Um, and, you know, who knows what will happen next, but it is kind of nuts because it's like, if I hadn't, if I hadn't been on the journey of writing the book, which already felt like a dream come true, like, like we already talked about, I just felt, I just felt like I had to do this thing. Um, well, and then of course I put together a book proposal and (laughs) pitched it around and all that, but I was like, I just, I just have to do this. And then if I hadn't followed that path, then I wouldn't have almost stumbled upon my heritage here. And I guess I say stumbled upon, but like there's, you know, only so much of it is actually stumbling upon and and like quite a bit of it is also very purposeful and, and very, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into citizenship, right? Yeah. Did it, 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 now, did your husband become an Italian citizen or no? So we, we're currently in the process of that, actually. So for... Wow. Yeah. So he actually just took his Italian language test, which which he needs to pass in order to apply for. That's like the spousal citizenship. Um, so he just took that, well, I think like two weeks ago. So we're waiting on his language results and then he'll uh, start that process, which should be pretty fast, actually, now that I have my citizenship. I wonder how you, I'm wondering how you say Connor in Italian. Hey, Connor. Yes. Yes. Hey. That's actually really good. <laughs> totally. And it's so funny because like, I always got such, uh, such a kick out of how our British friends said it. Kona. <laughs> be like, no, it's Connor. Right. <laughs> Kona. And then, yeah, exactly how you said it is how the Italians say it. It's so funny. The hard R. <laughs> the hard R, con or, and it's like the or, con or. Yeah. Con, yeah. It's so good. It's so good. He's still, he's always gonna, just going to be Connor to me, though. <laughs> of course. Connor from America via yeah, my Italy. Old, <laughs> yeah, my good old Michigander, Connor. <laughs> but, you know, the story that you tell, you know, or stories, plural, that you tell through the book, you know, cheese, wine, and bread is really about this, what's in your DNA. Like you're uncovering yourself through the journey. The calling is something that you can't really describe. You just know you have to do it. And the pursuit of the story is what sort of gives you yourself, gives you your joy. Absolutely. I- You know, it's so interesting to think about because when I first started this book project, I really wasn't sure how much like memoir, if you want to say that, how much, how much memoir would really be woven into it. Right. I was like, I want to make a book about cheese, wine and bread. This is not about me at all. But as I was writing, I realized that actually my personal journey was just as much, like it completely intertwined with my desire to learn about these things and, and then having these immersive experiences. And so I would say that the personal journey is the, the through line. It's the narrative that, that connects all of these experiences. It's not front and center necessarily throughout the book. I would say that cheese, wine, and bread are the stars of the book. But I felt like by sharing my personal story that others could relate to it, they could put themselves in my shoes, they could be on the journey with me, and it would make it so much more than a cookbook, right? So much more than like some nerdy fermentation guide, like the textbook elements, it it makes it it makes it relatable. And those are my favorite kinds of books. So that's when I realized, okay, Katie, you got it. You got to get vulnerable. There's no way around it. You just have to. And and that's what makes this um, so beautiful, you know, and, and I want to just, we we have one more uh, food group to hit on here before, because we're going to have to go soon. (laughs) So I wanted to sort of tantalize our listeners about the bread experience, because in France, you hung out with the queen of contemporary bread making. Yeah. Yeah. Apollonia Poilen. And she absolutely is, I mean, bread royalty in France and arguably worldwide because Poilen Bakery is, is so world famous. 
You know, the thing that I'm so fascinated by with her and with Pauline Bakery and the work that they do is that, yeah, it, it's I mean, the work that they do is very contemporary and, and in some ways cutting edge, right? Because they talk about the grains. They don't talk about just flour, right? Because I think a lot of times flour can be divorced from the grain and the field with from which it comes. And like they talk about the grains, right? And they, you know, they talk about natural fermentation, i.e. sourdough. That's the only way uh, they make yeah. their bread. They don't do at these. Yeah. I mean, their bread is just so stinking good. But at the same time, and just as important, just, just as important is the heritage with which they operate and they, and really drives all of their decisions. So Paulin Bakery was founded by Apollonia's grandfather right around the world wars. And this was, this was when already bakeries in France and, and worldwide were starting to maybe get slightly more industrial in the way they did things, right? We're, it's not, we're not full on supermarket culture yet, but even then, you know, industrial food was, it was starting to take hold a little bit. And, and Apollonia's grandfather was always like, no, I'm going to do this. The, the way that I grew up with bread, like sourdough, that's it. Um, just simple, really high quality ingredients. And that has been continued. Lionel, Apollonia's father continued this. So for Apollonia, it is it like bread is like a family value. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to talk to her. She's, she's such, she's an really inspirational person and character and, and really, yeah, meeting with her was, was quite the way to kick off my, my adventures all around France. You know, the thread that pops out to me, and you know, when you talk about these three elements and, and, and the history and the texture of great food, you know, great cheese, great wine and great bread is the sort of the passion, you know, the passion of the process and, and the journey, you know, each one of these industries has a, a great journey unto itself, you know, yeah. a great evolution. And maybe that is part of the story that you're telling as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that you touched on that part of it too. There's so, there's just so many angles with which to, see these things. And like the historical perspective is so fascinating. And I do bring that in, you know, the, talking about the amphoras, um, that have been uncovered from ancient Rome, right. That tell us a lot about how, how in ancient Rome, they, they drank wine and how that was a part of their culture. And yeah. And it's just, there's so much and, on, so and much. on and on and on and, and on know, and on and people, on. Yeah. Our listeners are going to have to read the book. So I want to toast yeah. you. <laughs> I want to toast you um, to cheese, wine, and bread, discovering the magic of fermentation in England, Italy, and France. To learn more about Katie Quinn and her work and her book, please visit www.katie-quinn.com, on Twitter at QKatie, on Facebook, the QKatie, and on Instagram, Q Katie, you can also check her out on YouTube. She posts new videos once a week, which is a really big deal. Anybody that knows about video production, so you can check her out there. And Katie, come back and hang out. This is great. I would love to, and I will, I will cheers to, I will cheers to that. Thank you so much for having me on, Lisa. Oh, thanks for being here. And oh, those, those cheddar brownies. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's grab that quick pause. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're talking about delicious stories and food adventures for the mind, body, and soul. My next guest is Mandy Lee, who founded her award-winning Angry Food blog, 
ladyandpugs.com in 2012 out of sheer frustration after moving from New York City to Beijing. She and her blog have been featured in numerous publications, including Savour, foodandwine.com, Yahoo, Food52, and the WashingtonPost.com. She lives in Hong Kong with her hubby and her pups. And we're talking about her new cookbook, The Art of Escapism Cooking, a survival story with intensely good flavors. And Mandy is not only an author, but she really is a chef. Mandy, it's late in Hong Kong. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello, how are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, I am actually really excited to have you. I'm actually now holding your book on my lap like a kind of Bible. It has this oh, most delicious you. cover of of a of a succulent burger of some kind yes. with beautiful Pork belly crackling burger. Oh my god! With egg. So the pork, the the patty was made with pork belly, and then you dice up fatty pancettas, and then you kind of, you know, you kind of like um, press that into the surface of the patty, and then and then you you make it crispy, so you have all these like fat cracklings and crusted patty. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. But, it's not the healthiest thing, I know, but you know, once in a while. <laughs> no, once in a while uh, it's a it's a really good treat, but you make people food and you make pup food. That's that's the things that some of yes. us might not know about you. Yes. Um well, I I make food for my dogs. So, um I like well, I when I was in New York, I I I actually had a homemade dog food company. That didn't take off at all. But, you know, after I moved to, um, to Beijing, actually, um, we, we moved, I, I had a Maltese and a French bulldog back in New York and we brought them to Beijing with us. And because of old age, both, both of them got really sick while we were there. And then, so, you know, they didn't want to eat anything. So I started, I, you know, re picked up this, you know, homemade dog food thing. In, and I, I could, you know, you know, I developed some like recipes so that, you know, to entice them to, to eat something. <laughs> yeah, so, and I just cannot imagine, you know, writing a cookbook without, without making them part of it because they're such a huge part of my life. So you talk about escapism cooking is not a passion. It's a drug. Mm -hmm. that, mm, talk a little bit about that and how you, discovered that you were an escapist cook? Yeah, I say it is not a passion because I, I don't want to sugarcoat it because I feel like a lot of people, I mean, like the, the cooking nowadays, a, a lot of times it's, you know, um, painted as a, um, like, you know, like a, like a, pa I have this passion and this, this is a lifestyle like, you know, like Gwyneth Paltrow, Goop, that kind of thing. But for me, it wasn't really like that. <laughs> for me, it's like I moved to Beijing in 2010 and I I lived there for six years and it was the most difficult time of my life. And when I describe it to people, I say, like, I try to be honest. I don't want to sugarcoat it. So I say, think about, think of an old lady who never leaves her house that is full of cats that weird old lady. And then all, all, all she does all day is feeding and grooming and lint rolling her carpets. So I'm the old lady and cooking is my cat. <laughs> uh. Okay. I mean, would it be more healthy for the old lady to go out and join some senior community and make some friends? Yeah, yeah. probably. But she chose the cats. So that was me. So, you know, the book is about, you know, how, how I, cope with my my unhappiness by cooking you know good or bad you know whatever works well you write this book is a memoir of recipes and stories that i had documented mm -hmm. during a desperately unpleasant time of my life mm -hmm. the delicious aftermath of how i cooked my way out of six miserable years in beijing <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> wow girl <laughs> And I just want to make it, I mean, like, this is a very personal book and everything I say in the book is from my personal point of view. I mean, a lot of people are living in Beijing and they're perfectly happy, you know, so that's them, but I didn't have a good time. So it's my personal opinion. I'm not trying to speak for anyone else, but, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, difficult for, for me to live there. And you went because of? 
Well, um, so we actually we left New York in 2008, right after that financial crash thing. And my husband was offered a job in Hong Kong, uh, which was a more stable market at the time. So we moved and then we stayed in Hong Kong for a year and a half. And then we moved to Beijing also for his job. So I was like the expat wife. Which is a thing in a in it Asia. It is a thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, the expat wife, but not really in the expat flow. Like you weren't the. It doesn't sound like you were the lady who lunched outside of your house. No, no, I have no friends when I was in Beijing, and um, I talked about. Um, I didn't really go into that in the book, but. It's difficult for me to make friends in Beijing because I feel like, I mean, to talk about this, I guess I have to talk about why I was not happy in Beijing. And I think that like most people don't realize this, but, but China is an authoritarian country. And I don't think that people know what that means. I didn't know what it meant before I went. And it means that you are living under this restrictive environment where you have to be, a, you, you need allowance on what you can say, watch, or listen. And um, it's this like constant psychological bullying that, that I just didn't know how to cope with. So, and going back to why it was difficult to make friends, because a lot of people who live there are happy there. But I feel like in order to be happy there, you kind of have to self, self hypnotize a little bit. You kind of have to justify this authoritarian environment because, you know, people don't want to. I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I feel like people don't want to admit that by living there for economical gains, you are in some way kind of complicit. And then that's how I felt the whole uh. time I was living there. And I was in this like constant emotional struggle, kind of hated myself for it, kind of. I don't know if you're aware of this whole like the South Park NBA thing going on with China. Are you aware of that? No, tell us. No, so so there was, so you don't you don't know that this like um, there's there was this general manager in I think it was Rockets like one of one of the basketball teams in NBA. So he tweeted something um, that says, um, "Fight for democracy, stand with Hong Kong." So that's what's going on in Hong Kong right now. And then, of and the the Chinese government, the the the, the people in China got so angry, he had to immediately delete the tweet. And, and this, I think, I believe it was like the spokesman of NBA had to apologize to China. Yes. Or I, something I, like I, that. I, I do know. Yes, 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 yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, and then a couple of days later, South Park came out with this episode to make fun of this whole, like how, how the American industries are losing their freedom of speech, even if they are not in China, just because they want a piece of that market. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Hollywood, how they have to cater you know, how to, how they have to alter their script, you know, just so that the, the Chinese people are happy about it. And then, you know, how like, you know, you can exercise your freedom of speech because it's going to, it's going to stop the market, the Chinese market. So, so that was the South Park thing. And then they, after that, they issued a sarcastic apology to China. And then the, the, it says like, you know, we too love money more than freedom and democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I feel like that's, that's how I felt when I was, when, when I was, but it's a difficult thing for most people to admit. And then, you know, so, so it's, it's, a, I think that to, to be happy there, you have to kind of self hypnotize and I, I couldn't do that or I was just really bad at it. So, yeah. So you started the blog and you got busy cooking in isolation for you and the pups. Yeah. Yeah, and literally. Th that's how you handled your, yeah, that's, that was your mental health program, it sounds like. That's why I said it was not healthy. And yeah. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to sell it as a healthy thing. Like, you know, like looking back, it was there because I could like be, I could, you know, just stay in my apartment and not leave. I literally did not leave my apartment for like days on end, like a week or something. Wow. And that could, that, that couldn't possibly mean something good. <laughs> and how was that on on your relationship with your husband? 
Oh, I think it definitely took a toll on me because I was there for him. So, you know, even though I agree to do it and it's not like he forced me to do it, but then, you know, it's hard not to have some kind of a resentment towards towards him like you know oh i'm unhappy because of you but then like i feel like my i'm i'm happily married i'm still happily married and i feel like to the same guy we should qualify that to the same guy <laughs> to the same guy yeah. you know <laughs> where we made it we made it out of china so like you know like i i feel like our marriage had a strong enough foundation to to weather through that period of time but then you know it was definitely a, you know, a, a difficult time for our marriage as well. And the result, we are the beneficiaries of this difficult time in your life in that <laughs> you came up with these wild recipes that are really awesome. I want to read a couple. You talked about the crackling studded pork belly burger that's on mm -hmm. the cover, but then mm -hmm. there's buffalo fried chicken ramen. Yep. Huh? Fast and furious <laughs> carbonara, poached eggs with miso brown butter hollandaise, and here's a good one. Mochi with peanut brown sugar and ice cream. Yum. Yeah. Mm hmm. So what inspired you with this East West melange? Like, could you even readily get some of these ingredients? How was that? Yeah, I mean, my cooking is always heavily influenced by where I am, because like for me, like cooking, I always I, I start a recipe because I always start a recipe because I have a question to answer like how does it work you know what happens if i put these two things together and what happens if i take that out and so like i'm always whenever i'm traveling or i'm living in a new place i'm always blown away by how a culture applies an ingredient in a way that is unimaginable to another you know ah. for example like tuna like a tuna tuna in a in a u.s or europe is like a steak or a can right but yeah. then like in Japan, they smoke it, they dry it, shave it, and they use that as some kind of a tea leaves to brew their stock. I mean, who would have thought? You know, so then like all these things are just like mind blowing to me. And then so so like when I'm when I was in, in, in Beijing, I was exposed to a lot of their regional cuisine, you know, a lot of different ways to to use an ingredient, a lot of different ingredients. So you know, like a lot of these these recipes are ideas where um, where I was inspired by by where I live. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with author and chef Mandy Lee. We're talking about the art of escapism cooking, a survival story with intensely good flavors. To learn more about Mandy Lee and her work, please visit LadyandPups.com on Twitter at Lady and Pups. Facebook and Instagram are both Lady and Pups. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book. Are we happy yet? Eight keys to unlocking a joyful life. A boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness is available at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Mandy Lee and me are talking about delicious stories and food adventures for the mind, body, and soul. Let's get back to it. So Mandy, before the break, you talked about the Beijing years and um, how mm -hmm. they served as a catalyst for many of the recipes and stories in this book. I want to ask you about your cooking skills, how you learned to mm -hmm. cook, what inspired you to become a chef? I mean, I'm not, I don't, okay, well, like, I don't call myself a chef, like, I, I, I've never cooked professionally, so I always say I'm a home cook, <laughs> um, and, like, I, I started, 
Okay, I I kind of I learned cooking from watching TV, like literally. Like when I was in New York um, and for college,、um, I would watch. I would like put on food channels and and in, in, in the background while I do my stuff, and then I just started picking up, you know, like you know, the, like techniques or like you know, like ingredients or like how how things are used. I just started to pick it, pick that up, and apply that in, into my own cooking. So. So yeah, I feel like I mean this sounds weird, but literally, like I think I TV taught me how to cook. <laughs> not my mother, not my grandmother. I know that's the story that most you know that people like, but that's not that's not how it happened for me. So just the cooking shows, uh, or or you like a yeah, you, a YouTuber, <laughs> a YouTuber, <laughs> yeah, or YouTube as well. You know, I guess like YouTube is nowadays TVs, like you know Netflix. You know, just like traveling shows. You know, where like they they you know maybe they 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 took the camera into the kitchen and then you know like they document like how how people make that dish. And I I was watch that. I was fascinated. I was just oh I'm gonna try that too. So yeah, I'm like I I love watching TV, and then you know like. It's, I literally, I just, I, I picked up all these things by watching TV. I love it. Self-taught by the tube. The other thing that's very interesting about your work is that you categorize your recipes by mood and occasion. So, like, do you have like a pissed-off、yeah. department? <laughs> And、all of them are pissed off. <laughs> I'm always pissed off. <laughs>、um, yeah, because I don't, I don't, because it, it corresponds to how I eat. Like I don't, I never eat. Like I never, in my, I never think about food in categories. Like the, at least the traditional way, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like I eat. You know, I could be having popcorns for dinner or whatever. Just the, what, whatever I feel like at the time. So I feel like the cookbook has to be sort of reflect that. You know, I have, you know, I break them down into like for a crowd and for snacking, where I explain that this is, you know, what differentiates the two is just the portions. <laughs> like you know, for snacking, a small portion for crowd is like you know, bigger portions. Yeah. So I feel like you know, like I don't, I don't try, I don't. Um, I feel like people should stop, you know, putting food in boxes. Like you know, like this is breakfast food, you know, that is brunch food, and that is dinner. I mean, just like you know, make and eat whatever you want, whenever you want. But your food is such、um, a hybrid style. Like I look at some of these recipes:、yeah. wontons with shrimp and chili, coconut oil, <laughs> and herbed yogurt. Herbed yogurt is not something you would typically find in an Asian dish. Yeah, it's not.、Um, you know what? It's because I think because.、Um, I grew up in Taiwan, and Taiwan used to be a former colony of Japan. So I, I, I grew up, and then during my travelings and then you know my 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 backgrounds, I realized that there is n- there's no such thing as authentic food. All foods are some in some form or another fusion. It, it, all of them are because、so、like、true. you know if if food does not evolve, then we would be chewing on tree barks. Still, you know, or like gnawing on raw meats, because like all foods is a progression of of human history and migration and everything like that. And for me, it's like I imagine like if 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 the culture of 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 say like Thailand and you know in、uh, historically clashed, you know, clashed with Italian, you know, like what would have happened? And then I came up with like tom yum pizza or margarita, tom yum margarita pizza, because I、Ooh. feel like. Yeah, yeah, it will work. Like, why not? Just because it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Because you know, like history hasn't played out that way. But that doesn't mean it couldn't work. And all of the best food that I, I've had in my life is in some form or another a clash of multiple cultures. So that's how I think about food, and that's how I, you know, like, why not? I always say, like, why not? Why not? I mean, you you inspire、yeah. creativity, you inspire risk taking in the kitchen. But there's something else that is very inspirational about your work, and that is、um, your photography, because、no. the, the book contains your photographs of this very luscious, sensuous food that you prepare. Talk a little、yeah. bit about yourself as the documentarian of your own creations. So I still don't think of myself as a photographer, and I still think of myself more as a cook than a photographer. And I only picked up photography because I need to document my food. So, so my photography is really about making people want to eat this. 
You know, it was not about like <laughs> the seduction. A, yeah, it's not about like selling a lifestyle because I don't have a lifestyle to sell. You know, it's not about like um, you know, like the French countryside or something like that. So like my, my the photography is always about like it's minimalistic and the food is you know the only subject, and I just want to make it look as delicious as I believe they are. I don't try to you know like portray my foods in in ways that does not reflect reality. So I was making like try to make it as delicious as as I believe they are, and want make people want to eat them. You know, isn't that what food photography should be about? Yes, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm looking at a recipe now that I have in my hand. It looks like it's, I don't know, is it, um, oh, here it is, mala smoked meat with tahini mustard. So to me, mm -hmm. this looks like Jewish corned beef, but it's not. Yes. <laughs> I mean, smoked, yeah, smoked beef is like the Montreal version of pastrami, sort of. I mean, I know that there's like subtle differences and that they will fight, you know, not to call it the same thing. But then to me, it's like similar. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then mala is a Sichuan um uh, flavor profile where it's like the spicy and the numbing, you know, aspect of Sichuan cuisine. So basically, you know, I, I just alter the brine. I, 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 you know, I make the brine of the beef, you know, uh, in a Sichuan style and it came out, you know, in a Sichuan style, but it looks like corned beef. Yeah. You know, and then I pair it with like, um, ses like tahini or the sesame paste is the thing. It's a big thing in China too. So, so, you know, I think that was like, okay, that could work. Why not? Because, you know, again, why not? <laughs> How has your cooking changed since you moved from Beijing, China to Hong Kong? Has there been an um, evolution? Are more ingredients more readily available or what, what has changed, if anything? I think that. My personal preference, why I, I always like things that is like um, intense and heavy and spicy. So, so for me, like Beijing probably was better for that. And then Hong Kong, Hong Kong cuisine is kind of like Cantonese cuisine, which is like more subtle, you know, like kind of like, you know, French cuisines, like, you know, they, they emphasize, emphasize on subtlety and, the um, freshness uh, of the ingredient. They try to make the ingredient shine. So um, I think that like, however, wh wherever I am, I always try to reimagine what a dish could be like. So for example, like in Hong Kong, I would eat something. If, if I feel like this could be kicked up a notch, if I do this, you know, then, then I would, I would, I would try to alter that dish that way. So, so it's always, it's always a progression for me, like cooking. Well, and, and then how does, um, your human cooking influence your dog cooking? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> or, or I, vice can't versa. As, <laughs> I can't be as creative with um dog food as I am with it because obviously like they can't eat spicy food you know they can't eat salt or, like they can't eat too much of sugar so you know you try to keep them as healthy as possible but like I mean dry food is just tastes horrible I mean everyone knows that but like like snacks and dog biscuits and all that stuff it could be, it could taste a lot better if you just, you know, add in a little bit of cheddar, put in a little bit more liver, you know, just things that they like, you know, like in maybe, maybe you don't have in as much creativity freedom you can have as human foods, but you can still try to like make it taste better. Well, I, I, I want to congratulate you for taking the gamut of your emotional life and expressing it creatively through your work through the um the art of escapism cooking because not only is it a survival story with intensely good flavors but these are wonderful stories and recipes that allow us to sort of get into this um uh, crossroads of east west style cooking that's like super creative and fun and edgy thank you thank you so much i mean like it's always just I'm always so glad when I hear like, you know, when people like the book or like what I read and what I mean, what I wrote. So, you no, know, thank you. So many. it really means a lot. Well, I say stay pissed off. Stay angry. It's working for you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's funny to say on a show about happiness. But when, that is your when, happy place. When, what's happening in Hong Kong? I mean, yeah. <laughs> that may very well come true. Yeah. Uh, well, stay safe. That's the most important thing. Oh, yeah, of course. To learn more about Mandy Lee 
and her work, please visit ladyandpups.com, on Twitter at Lady and Pups, on Facebook and Instagram, Lady and Pups. We're talking about the art of escapism cooking, a survival story with intensely good flavors by my guest, author and chef, Mandy Lee. Mandy, thanks so much for hanging out with me. I know it's late Thank over there. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, you're <laughs> my pleasure. Thanks for joining us today on Harvesting Happiness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen and my guests, Katie Quinn and Mandy Lee, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Go out and rock your day and be kind to each other. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.